I'm going to do a little bit of introduction here and get into a little bit of a conversation, and then um, we're really going to turn it to you. But I would like a show of hands at the beginning here. Um, how many people are here because they are long-standing, dedicated fans of this gentleman? Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it has been such a treat for us um, with thanks to one of our alums of our graduate fellowship program, Robert, <laughs> Brian Rock, to, um, to welcome Brian Lamb here. Um, and uh, we've been, we've had a lot of fun this afternoon already. Um, but um, I just knew that those of you who were coming here this evening would probably be familiar with some of what he does. So I am going to begin by asking him a few questions, but pretty quickly move it into an open flow with the room because um, I have a feeling that what you're going to ask and what's going to come from you is very, is very similar to what I would ask, or maybe not, or maybe very similar to what he does. It's a style some of us try to emulate and no one really master it. I certainly don't master it. I've already lost it by talking too much, which is a, a serious condition that I suffer from. <laughs> Chronic condition. I do need to remind everyone to please silence uh, your cell phones. I've been told that that's very important. Um, we are videoing and recording here, so when you raise your hand and one of our Eagleton staff members gives you a microphone, don't make this comment. Oh, my voice is, I, everyone can hear me, I don't need this, because that's not the reason you're getting the microphone, you're getting it because in order to record, you must speak into the microphone. So just to remind you of that, we'd be very grateful if you do that with us. The game plan here, as I said, is I'm going to make a few opening, I'm going to ask a few opening questions and then turn it to you. Um, before the first question, I want to say that this is officially um, the Lewitt Lecture, the annual Lewitt Lecture at Eagleton. Um, and that is, um, it is an endowed program um, that was established by the family of a gentleman whose background actually was not politics. I don't know if we sent you any information on this, but he was a pharmacist. And it's kind of a great political story because he was a pharmacist who knew everybody in the community. And so when someone decided to run for office, they decided that he would be the very best person to manage the campaign because he'd know everybody in the community. And he agreed to do it. And as a result of getting engaged, as so many people tell this kind of story, I got involved because I found out going around and talking to people and knocking on doors and contacting them that this was really a wonderful experience. He got hooked. And uh, after that, spent his life in politics. He went to Washington. He was a staff member for two senators there. And when he died um, and left some money to his family, his sister endowed the Lewitt Lectureship at Eagleton um, in order to uh, honor him and to allow us to invite people who can talk about politics, whether they've run for office or whether, as in the case of Brian Lim, um, they well, they've learned about it from personal experience, but also from talking to many, many people. Um, so this is Albert Lewitt's lecture. Um, and Nancy Herman, who is his niece and usually sits in the audience, couldn't be here tonight. But we're videoing, so hi, Nancy. This is for you. Uh, we're happy to be here for you and sorry to miss you and hope you come, can come next time. Uh, Brian Lamb, uh, as you know, is the founder, the CEO, the executive chair of the board over the course of time of something, a phenomenon really, an institution called C-SPAN, which was created in this country at a moment when it's not just that this institution didn't exist, I don't think, and I can be corrected here and I'm sure he will, the concept didn't exist. Um, and so for me he is a hero, a huge, innovative, 
creative hero who had an idea and then we call people entrepreneurial these days but it's more than entrepreneurial you see something that's missing and you make it happen and you don't make it happen because you wake up one morning and you've never heard anything about all of this and you don't have you know kind of the right connections to put together he was in he knew the cable industry and he found a way to bring an idea together with the people who could make it happen and you've all benefited from it by being C-SPAN viewers in one way or another. Um, I've told him already he's probably had enough of this today from me, but um, I spend every Sunday evening with him. Uh, and uh, often my dinners get later and later. I used to eat at an early hour, but now, hey, <laughs> after 60 minutes, it's Brian Lamb. And it was book notes, and now it's Q&A. Um, and then, of course, um, if we want to watch the State of the Union um, or um, uh, want to watch, as I did recently, a wonderful lecture by an historian who'd written a book about the history of the Republican Party, I mentioned that before, or covering Congress, or on and on and on. It's all there on C-SPAN. And I'm a little bit concerned, and I wanted to address this at some point later on, about what that's going to look like past my time and past his in the future. Uh, because of what's going on uh, these days in the media. But I want to go back um, to the moment of creative genius and welcome you again and <laughs> ask you, so how did this happen? I mean, was this a flash of insight? Was it, most people who tell stories of creativity say, well, it really wasn't that. I just put this together with that and I took that step and so forth. Tell us all how it happened. We've all benefited from it. <clears throat> well, it started uh, when I grew up in a small town in Indiana. Oh, wow, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> You're saving me from asking about your parents. <laughs> it made a big difference, though, because I went to the Navy after I graduated from Purdue University, and it was the first time that I learned about a lot of things. Um, I, I loved my childhood and Purdue and all that, but <clears throat> getting on a ship and Going overseas was uh, a real experience that had a major impact on I me. Mean, I, I guess this is very simple. But when I would go back to my hometown, go back to Indianapolis, uh, and visit my friends, I would tell them what I saw living in Washington that they didn't see on the evening news. Because the evening news was restricted with the time. Uh, and in those days, back in the 70s, you could we were talking about this earlier, but you couldn't you get your Wall Street Journal uh, a day late because you had to get it in the mail, and you couldn't get a New York Times, and you get a Chicago Tribune or any other star. But anyway, it just seemed to me that we were a big country, and there was a lot of power concentrated in three television networks in New York City. And you were getting somewhat of the same thing out of each one of them. And it's always technology that changes things. And what happened, you had the cable industry since 48, uh, but they basically were a, an extension of an antenna for stations all around the country, including New York City, <clears throat> where you couldn't see television because of the buildings. And the cable industry was looking for new ideas. And we put together this idea around, uh, it was a cooperative. I, you know, I was the, as you say, the founder, but really there were 22 founders. And I'm not kidding you. There were, if it hadn't been for these business people who ran these cable companies saying, we will do this, we will fund it, we'll underwrite it, and we'll make it a nonprofit, it would never be there because this has not made them a dime. And so it started with the satellite going up and the desire for new programming, <clears throat> and we were unique. We were very different. And we weren't that expensive in the beginning. That's it. I, I've learned that it's almost always about money. <laughs> almost always. I, it's a rare occasion when it's not. And we were able to do this for a very little amount of money. We still do it for relatively small, small amount. Yeah. What, you mentioned the annual budget, I think, when we were up. 65 upstairs. million a year. 65 million. And 280 <laughs> employees, uh, and we're all located in, in one spot right near the Senate of the United States. And it's always been kept simple because if you get fancy with this kind of stuff, you're going to be out of business. Because the audience is never going to be enough. Just, just not be because you mentioned 
the budget and, and uh, repeated it now. So in the relative world, so compared to, what's the budget of? Well, if, MSNBC. If, if, if or these figures are correct, and they were reported by, uh, and I, I got to be careful because I, you know, I've only read about them. But if, if you combine the profit of CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News, it's four billion a year, and we're sixty-five million just to run the world. We raise what we raise, we spend by and large. We save, we save every penny we can because of. Uh, the need to have some protection uh, in case the, the worst of it happens. But um, I don't know what the budget is for CNN or, or Fox or MSNBC. But we're talking probably half a billion dollars a year, probably. And CNN has growth all over the world. Fox does not, but CNN does. And MSNBC, of course, has NBC, and they're more restricted than they used to be. What's the highest salary at C-SPAN? Mine. <laughs> Actually, actually, that's not true, uh, because I have stepped down as CEO, and we now have uh, two, uh, we have co-CEOs, and the highest salary that anybody's ever been paid is he spends $400,000. And the highest salary at Fox, or? Oh, I think Roger Ailes last year made $24 million. And, I mean, these figures are available in the New York Times. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, there's... There's millions and millions and millions being made by people who are interested. And, and people might know this more than I do, but where does the $65 million come from? It all comes from the homes of people that either subscribe to cable or subscribe to satellite. And we get six pennies a month per home, 72 cents a year. Uh, and if you want to contrast that with a you know, an ESPN, uh, they get somewhere between six sixty and seven dollars a month. So, you know, it, it, you can see that what is it times a hundred from what we get, and it's just it's just where people place their values. Uh, and I don't say that negatively. People love sports; they're willing to pay these incredible amounts of uh, money for uh, sports figures, and um, at least so far. I mean, I, there's going to come a time, I think, when this it's not going to just keep going up. Although we have, I think we have a picture of the Washington Nationals that just signed this two hundred ten million dollar contract. It all comes back. It all comes. Back. So when you said it was a group, it was the decision of a group. But groups don't make decisions. I, you, I assume, were the person who played the leadership role in that, who brought the idea and who convinced people it was a good idea and that it could work and so on and so forth. And maybe there was dissension in the group, right? Or not really. I mean, what happened was that uh, uh, people with a lot better stature than mine in the industry said yes early. Um, a fellow named Bob Tish, probably never heard of. Uh, no, no, not saying Bob Tish. <laughs> it's spelled T I T S C H. I worked for him in Cablevision Magazine, and uh, he uh, he was the first one to let me work for him half time. Pay me full time, but work for him half time to put C SPAN together. And then the first cable television executive was a fellow by the name Bob Rosencrantz, who said uh, I, I made a presentation to a room just about this size with this many people in it. And there was one guy and his sidekick that came up afterward, one in the room, and said, I like your idea. I think I can help you do this. And his name was far more important than mine. And then he said, eventually, here's a check for $25,000. Take this check and see if anybody else will match it. And so I literally went from person to person to person. And Ralph Baruch was second. Ralph, Car uh, uh, Ralph uh, uh, Russell Carp was third. I can just go down the list. And they all wrote checks for $25,000. And we had about $450,000 to start with. It was enough money for us to buy our Earth station, our uplink, and, and hire four people. Um, I think my first paycheck in the first year was 25 or something like that. When did you know it was going to work? This was going to fly? I always knew it was going to work. You did? <laughs> but that's how naive I was. I mean, I always thought that this was something that people would, not everybody, but if we kept the cost down, it was going to work. And we had some very rocky times. Uh, we had one particular 
1982 is a terrible time when we, uh, we when we changed our satellite in the sky. One of the companies that we were involved with dropped us from 400 cities. Uh, they didn't want to make the move, and um, it all worked out. But it was very painful getting back. So <clears throat> this is not like selling sports, uh, and we don't have ratings, and we don't have stars, uh, and uh, we don't have ads. Uh, and so it's just what it is. It's nothing. I mean, what you see is what you get. And the, the trick is not spending more money than people think it's worth. So if it's not like selling sports, what's your elevator speech? What's the pitch? Well, in the early days, it was much different than it would be today. Um, Today, I would say, if you drop us, the country's going to go to hell in a handbasket. In the beginning, it was, this is new and unique and different, and it's not going to cost you very much, and it might actually do some good for our country. It was that simple. And not everybody bought that. Some people thought, I remember our current general counsel, a guy named Bruce Collins, has been here forever, like the rest of us. He went to a seminar at Yale, and one of our, won't mention any names, still alive, uh, one of our cable operators was on a panel, and they asked him in the audience, why did he, uh, you know, why did he uh, support C-SPAN? And he really wasn't a very good supporter of C-SPAN. And he said, but well, it's nothing but a PR gimmick. But our general counsel took issue with him right there in the room, thank God, and stood up and said, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Because it was. It was not a PR gimmick. Uh, there are certainly people in those first 22 that went along with it because Bob Rosencrantz did, or went along with it because Russell Carp did. Uh, and as anybody that's been involved in any of these kind of things, raising money for anything, knows that the first one is your easiest one, and the last one is your hardest one. Yeah. And that last one was tough. I, I remember the moment, and it, that person that was tough is a very big name in communications today, uh, and, but he did come with us, and we're still here. And is your current board composed of the people who are on that original one? Who's on your current board? We have 21 people on our board. Uh, we used to have 41. That's how, what's happened to the industry. We actually... We don't lose anybody. We've got down to 10 right now based on what's going on in the business. But um, there are only on our board today, I think, one or two people that were on there 30 the original years ago. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Thank goodness they're still alive, but uh, they, they've sold out and uh, they're retired. At its height, how large was your audience and how can you tell? I mean, do you do? How do you know? And which which program? Is it Washington Journal or is it? You know, probably we don't really know because we've never had ratings on any one show, but probably our most popular things on the network are the hearings. Mm -hmm. Because the hearings are where something actually happens. Not always. <laughs> but I, I, but when, when the floor activities are underway, you kind of know where they're going to go in advance. But during the hearings, uh, Actually, some of the hearings are so good that the sad thing is that some of these members only get five minutes. I wish they got more because some of them are very good questioners. Mm -hmm. Some of them are show voters and all that, but a lot of them ask some very good questions. And you have the mix, the for and against, and uh, that's probably our biggest audience. We do surveys every four years just to ask if you know who we are, how much you think you watch, you can't really believe it because <coughs> people, were, they say a lot of things um, that they don't necessarily mean. But I mean, it's, it's, it, the numbers are good. I mean, we, we've been able to identify something like, oh, 10 percent of America watches this every week at some point. Really? But, you know, I, we've that's, never sold numbers, ever. Uh, I think our biggest yeah. number we've ever had is like 50 million people a month watch some of C-SPAN. But... Um, it's a very individualistic decision. You flip by it. If you see something you like, you might stay for an hour. You might stay for 10 minutes. But most of our stuff isn't regular. You say you watch Sunday night, thank you, I need one viewer. <laughs> <laughs> we had a kid who, uh, we, every 
every year we do an interview with high school kids for one hour and they come to Washington and Senate Youth Program. I watched and, that. And this one and this one kid got up and said, I'm so happy to be here on C SPAN and your three viewers. I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was very given the group I thought that was very if you haven't seen this, I've seen it twice. How often have you done it? Uh, I've done it for the last three years. For three years, so I guess I missed the first year and I happened upon I guess the second year and then just a couple of weeks ago this year and this is the Mayflower Hotel in Washington and there are kids from every state and they are part of a program funded by the Senate and no, funded by the Hearst Foundation the Hearst Foundation yeah. but the Senate is involved right? Senate is involved only to the point that they the senators come and get their picture taken with the kid and they participate in the event so these kids come from all over the country and Brian Lamb stands there in this room at the Mayflower Hotel with his microphone and he goes around and just does a Brian Lamb. He <laughs> asks them, this time it was, there were lots of questions about what media do you watch, which I found, or how do you get your information, your news, which was very interesting because there were, you, you told me if you heard it differently, I was stunned about how many of them, if they were telling the truth, got it from BBC. There were about three of those. I didn't really believe it. <laughs> <laughs> These are very sharp kids. They yeah. They were very sharp. And they were, they're always fine. How do they get nominated for this? In the states, different people nominate them, and uh, they have a system that every state picks two. Pick a woman and a man, and they usually about juniors in high school and uh, most of them are headed they're, they're all headed to uh, great institutions like Rutgers. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, so they go to Purdue and Rutgers. <laughs> <laughs> As, I'm sorry I interrupted you because you mentioned that program right so is that like what your favorite thing to do is right now? It is a favorite yeah. thing to do. My yeah. favorite thing to do is to learn. I don't care who it is. I don't care what it is. I don't care what side you're on. And just teach me something. If I walk away from an hour interview and you haven't taught me something, I'm in trouble. I mean, it's just, you know, you go out and say, that was really not worth our time. <laughs> but it didn't happen at all. Thank goodness. Yeah. It's amazing. Um, I, I came in the first time after I saw that, I came into the office. There are people in the room now who will verify this and I sent a message around and said this was fantastic you have to watch it how can we do more of this kind of thing for our students and so forth it's just because we feel here um, so often so much the pressing need to give opportunities to college students to really um, come into contact with the people and the institutions which most of them just don't and we try hard to do that at Eagleton but uh, these kids they all talk to the president, and well, they, the they president. all love Susan Collins. And uh, my favorite thing was a young lady, I think it was a young lady, who quoted one of the speakers, and I can't remember who it was, saying, you can't hate up close. Uh, I don't remember who said that, but it was somebody that was that appeared for him. I thought that was a pretty interesting comment. Yeah, yeah. Going back just, and then I'm going to open this, but I, I want to go back to something about Washington Journal. Um, because it, was that the first program? What was the first program when you when first, you launched? Other than um, covering the House of Representatives when we launched, yeah. the first program that we did was Close Up with the Close Up Foundation. Mm -hmm. And they bring high school kids to Washington and we would do four programs a week. But I have to tell you why, uh, among other reasons we did this. Uh, an old friend of mine came to me, he was working for the Close Up Foundation. Steve Janger uh, founded the Close Up Foundation, did a fabulous job. We get thousands and thousands of high school students in Washington, and they weren't elite kids. They were kids that just could figure out a way to get there uh, and you know, raise the money that they needed for, for to be there for a week, and they'd take them around. Um, <clears throat> but I needed, I say I, there were four of us that worked there, I needed cameras, and I couldn't get anybody to buy me cameras. Uh, and we made a deal with Steve Janger, uh, who was a tremendous fellow, that he would buy the cameras, give them to us, not, we could basically use them, if we did four one half hour programs a week with high school students that he brought to town. And I said, that's, that's not hard. <laughs> and then we, in the early, very early days, we borrowed a tape machine, we traded a tape machine use 
Michael and Karen would appreciate this, uh, where store broadcasting no longer exists. They wanted satellite, they wanted microwave time out to the satellite to get to their stations, and we needed a, a tape machine, so we made a deal. We could use the tape machine when they're not using it, and we I hired a guy down at the press club who was in the basement of the press club by the name of Forrest Boyd. I had grown up in he was in Indianapolis as an anchor guy, and he came out to Washington to work for Mutual Radio, and then he started his own uh, television operation. And it, I said, what would you charge us to videotape the press club luncheon speeches mm -hmm. and get them to our, you know, where we were and we, where we needed the tape machine? And he came up with the price. He said, I'll, I'll buy the tape, I'll do the lights, I'll do the camera, and I'll bicycle them up to you for $200. <laughs> and so we literally started by this kind of stuff, borrowing this tape machine and all that stuff. And it just started to take off because of people that love information. And you see, you know, the press club uh, used to be a lot more popular than it was when we started because there wasn't television and the print press were there and writing all these, and they were, it was, they made a lot of news, but we've covered, I don't know, probably 2,000 National Press Club speeches since we've been in business, something like that. And then the call-in show was the first, we started out October 7, 1980, and that was the first national call-in show on television. It's still really the only call-in show left except for QVC and home shopping. <laughs> <laughs> because they find they find out in the business uh, on a, on a, that they can't control it. Um, and, and so you don't know what somebody's going to say. And if you watch our call in show, you know you do not know what somebody's going to say. And we've paid a price. We've been made fun of because of that. Uh, because people, and we don't have a delay. And we come very close to the start. <laughs> and you don't screen them before. Uh, we just answer them. Who are you? Where are you calling from? We do know where they're calling from because you can you have the phone ID yeah. these days. But it's it's caused some problems. There are people who won't come to our call show because they don't want to take a chance of having the wrong thing said to them. Uh, that was actually the the question I was going to ask: Is how, where did that idea come from? Um, not the, the call in, perhaps just per se, but also to separate out and have people call on partisan lines. That came out of, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the Clinton years. When Bill Clinton was president, uh, he was getting bashed every day. And there was an overwhelming number of people that were more angry with him than happy with him. And we decided, and I don't even like it, we decided to split the calls because we wanted to stay as balanced as possible. It's not easy to do that. But the same thing happened during the Reagan years and the George Bush years and, and the Obama years. And so in the end, it was, I think, the smartest thing to do because there's nothing worse than the, the angrier you are, the more you're apt to pick up the phone and call on us. Mm -hmm. You all know this from looking at the Internet. That's what I was going to say. What's I mean, the, the difference? The garbage, in the, yeah. you know, at the Internet. <clears throat> we don't get garbage. We get bad calls. But we don't. <laughs> on a regular basis, our callers are, are American. I mean, they are, our people out here are all different kinds of people. They say different accents, they have different loves and, and, and hates, and uh, we get it all. Uh, I think on the internet, sadly, you get mostly haters that come up. With, I mean, it's amazing. Somebody will uh, make their announcement that they're retiring. I just saw this this week, and it's just 25, you're a scumbag, you're a, you know, you're a left-wing Nazi or whatever they want to call you. It's all I, my view is that it's helpful because these are all people who need anger management and they can't <laughs> afford it, so they <coughs> do it through the internet. I, I actually, I don't... Spew it out. You don't have to read it, but it is. A, uh, and on, on our, some of our calls can be very nasty. Um, but I would rather people be able to say what they think somewhere in this world. And uh, I think it all worked out over time. And how do the people who answer the calls, the people who are your running the programs, how do they get trained to handle that? Because almost everyone does it your way, which is they well, never get triggered to argue back or answer, or it's always very even. Yeah, you know, some people would say that's not journalism, and uh, <laughs> but. The theory is that 
if you leave your phones open, if you divide your lines, if you have intelligent people watching you, that if somebody makes a misstatement, and they do this all the time, the next two or three calls, somebody will call up and correct it. And instead of us sitting there with all the knowledge, which we don't have, <clears throat> and constantly playing, you know, this is right, this is wrong, uh, whether it works or not, it's up to the viewer. But actually, only about a third of the people who watch us watch the call-in part. They don't, a lot of people don't like call-ins. And I understand. I mean, uh, but we try to give a little bit to everybody. We have three networks and a radio station. So. <laughs> and, uh, and we put some stuff on the, on the websites that we aren't on the so my last question about that is that so the people who watch and I asked you before what you thought the highest number was I and yeah, yeah I knew it. <laughs> uh, I noticed um, but also I was going to say the demographics um, I'm assuming that the people who are home during the day and able to call in are people who are retired and so that you've got largely an older population um, is that a concern? Is that incorrect? My assumption incorrect? Or? Right or wrong, it's the same for every news network. Every During the day. Network. Yeah, even at night. I mean, you look at the average age for people that watch the Bill O'Reilly show, and it's somewhere like 68. I mean, that's the figure I saw. And <clears throat> you'd be surprised at how old the audience is watching all of the news. I mean, the evening news shows are the same way. The people are at the average age is in the 60s. And um, our audience is not a whole lot different than any news network. Right? And it doesn't that, matter what time of day or evening. That's well, at night it's it, to get a younger crowd. I mean, at night because they're home. <clears throat> but today, we everything we do is on the archive. It's on uh, free and available to all of you to use. So there's an enormous number of people that will, let's say over the weekend, it's not just us, but Mrs. Clinton's announcement, you can go there to YouTube, you can go to anybody's website. In our case, you can go there for all the hearings. So if you've got time and there's a hearing that's of interest to you, let's say that during the net neutrality days, there was a lot of interesting stuff going on during that time, we covered it all. And if during the, the uh, health care bill, even though President Obama, who promised that all the negotiations would be on C-SPAN, and none of them uh, we, we covered almost every hearing that was held on the health care issue. So 50 years from now, if you want to see what was going on there, it's all there. And that's probably the, the most convenient thing we have been able to do for everybody. And our, our archive that was uh, actually invented and created by a man named Robert Browning, who is a professor at Purdue University somehow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> We, uh, and we not the 19th century poet. <laughs> His middle name's X. Robert X. And Robert X. And he doesn't use a period. So we call him X. <laughs> uh, but he came up with the idea of doing it. It's not associated with Purdue any longer. It's completely independent. We own it. But it's free. Um, and, you know, I, you have to you shake your pinch yourself when you realize what this our industry has been able to do. In spite of uh, what people may think of them, there's a lot of good uh, human beings involved in it. They've done very well themselves, but they did keep this going, and, and I'm quite grateful to it. So I am. I'm going to open this. I, before I do, I just want to read one <coughs> quote uh, because I was asking this question about the partisan lines, the open lines, and I just I've got a couple of quotes here. But I, I will use this one now. I love it. And you, of course, know it. It is um, an inscription. Um, and uh, the late writer Christopher Hitchens dedicated his 2005 biography of Thomas Jefferson to Brian Lamb. On the title page appears the words, for Brian Lamb, a fine Democrat, as well as a good Republican <laughs> who has striven for an educated electorate. And I was very moved when I read that, and I very couldn't sad. agree more. Yeah. He was, uh, I interviewed him 25 times. Uh, he came to your board when I did that. He was an amazing character. What fun oh, was he? Was. He didn't agree with anything he said. Right. <laughs> I asked him. 
every time he was on, are you still a socialist? And uh, one day on the show, he said, you haven't asked me the question, are you still a socialist? And I said, okay, are you still a socialist? And he said, no. <laughs> no longer a socialist. <laughs> so let me open it and then, yeah. Please uh, wait for the microphone and tell us who you are. Uh, good evening. I'm a junior. I'm Thomas Zobelli. I'm a junior here at Rutgers University. And uh, I, first of all, can't say uh, enough good things about uh, C-SPAN. I'm only 21, but I am an avid watcher. I watch every day. And I really do like the call-in show. I've actually gotten through 10 or 12 times. And <laughs> so I'm not on, so it's been... So it's been, uh, it's been great that way. And you kind of stole my thunder because I had a question about Washington Journal since that's my favorite program. But I was just curious, um, this came to my mind, how do you get all these different TV uh, cameras at all these different events? Like, I was just uh, watching uh, or listening on the app that you have uh, from Senator Marco Rubio's announcement. How do you get all these cameras to all these different events? That's amazing to me. So that's my question. Thank you. And keep up the great work at Cisco. Thomas. Yes. Thank you. Um, and keep trying to get through them now that I know who you are. I'll <laughs> <laughs> give her face to Greta. Give her face to Greta. She's my favorite. <laughs> I'll tell her you said that. <laughs> <laughs> the camera thing is, with, with any television network, it's, it's, it's kind of the same thing. Um, we have about eight different units in Washington that have multiple cameras, and they go out and set them up every day. It's almost like building a little television studio in the hearing rooms or in the forums. Um, the Rubio announcement today, I don't know how they got it. We often share. As a matter of fact, if I said how many times we share, people listening that are running some of these other networks probably wouldn't even like it. But we'll give somebody our feed from an event and they'll give us a, a feed from an event. I'll give you an example. Every th every hearing on Capitol Hill, with, uh, with rare exception, uh, whether you watch it on ABC or CNN or Fox, comes from our cameras. And it, that's developed over the years. And it's an odd reason. If, uh, if you require multiple cameras in a hearing room, they force you to be a pool. And you have to give away your product to anybody that's a member of the radio and television yard. So for years we were doing this and getting absolutely nothing in return. And our folks worked it out. As a matter of fact, it was a, a very nice <coughs> woman from ABC who agreed to take the lead. And now we get everything that the networks shoot of the president around the country, not overseas, but around the country, in exchange for this free product that they get from Capitol Hill. But we often will get a, uh, somebody will will hire a camera on location, we'll send a camera crew out to that location, or we will call up a television station in the area and say, are you going to cover this? And if you do, can we get it from here? Can we pay you a couple hundred dollars or whatever it is? We beg, borrow, and steal. <laughs> yeah. And everybody's pretty cooperative behind the scenes. They didn't used to be. When we first got into this business, that's what's changed. Uh, Michael, you've been doing this for 33 years, so you know. Uh, people weren't that helpful. The big networks didn't want to help us when we started. They wanted to, matter of fact, uh, they, they pulled some funny stuff. They cut our cords and stuff like that. They didn't take the lights down in the hearing room when they were finished. Um, and we, we had to use their lights. But it's a much more congeal, uh, uh, collegial group these days. And frankly, it makes sense because it cost so much money in the old days, they couldn't, they couldn't afford to do that that way. To do this. Yeah, thank you. You're Never been asked that. Now, we're the first time here. for everything, right? Congratulations. Hi, I'm Nancy Becker. In my former life, I ran the New Jersey Cable Television Association. Brian and I have known us a very long time, known each other a very long time. Would you tell everyone how you were able to persuade the House of Representatives and then the Senate to be covered? Because it seems so easy now, but it certainly wasn't then. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs> well, first of all, I did not persuade the House of Representatives. There's a myth there, and I had to pat <clears throat> that down for years. The younger members of Congress were agitating the older members of Congress back in 19... 
probably as early as 1974 or five, they formed a committee. It took six, six years where the older guys at the time uh, to vote on allowing cameras in the house. I was just in the middle of trying to convince the cable television industry to do something in public affairs. And we had a false start, it didn't work, and all of a sudden they voted in, in October of 1977 to allow cameras. It was an overwhelming vote, 300 and something, whatever. And we just took advantage of that moment, we got the industry together, they all said yes, they liked the idea, <clears throat> went to Tip O'Neill and said, and they hadn't made the final decision, but if you allow cameras in the chamber, we will carry it to the satellite and into cable television homes around the United States. But cable was really not very big then. It was only about 12 million homes. It's now the whole bunch is up to about 100 million, including the satellite. About a third of the homes are fed by satellite. And uh, they, frankly, Tip O'Neill didn't even, I mean, this is not, I, he was a great guy, but he didn't even understand it. I mean, most people didn't understand television at all. And I think if he probably had to do over again, God rest his soul, he'd probably say no. <laughs> but he finished, in spite of the problems it gave him, 65% uh, popular in this country when he went out of office as the Speaker of the House. The Senate was a really interesting story. Uh, the Senate had a guy named Russell Long from Louisiana and a guy named Bob Bird from West Virginia <laughs> and a couple other ones. And when the House went on television, we immediately went over to the Senate and said, how about you? <laughs> and uh, Howard Baker was elected majority leader in 1981. His first piece of legislation was a resolution to open Senate to television. Well, the Democrats thought he was doing it because he wanted to run for president. And Bob Byrd and Russell Long didn't ever want to see a camera in the chamber, ever. Uh, they were traditionalists. and. They didn't, they just thought it was a bad idea. So what we started to do uh, right away in 1980, 81, is that we would call up Senate offices every year and say, are you for or against television in the Senate? <laughs> and we had a little newspaper. We published this newspaper because nobody would pay any attention to it. They we weren't, we weren't getting any publicity. So we, we just created our own newspaper and we passed it around Capitol Hill. And one day I get a call from Bob Bird, who I did not know. And he said, uh, Ryan, I've uh, been reading your little newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> and I see this poll, and it shows that 62 people in the Senate are either in favor or leaning in favor of television. He said, is it accurate? And I said, yes, sir, it's accurate. We just call the offices. And he said, will you come over and talk to me about this? So I said, yes, sir, I'd be glad to. <laughs> so I went over to his office, and uh, I took a guy that worked with me at the time, who was a great guy, and he's a talker. <laughs> and on the way over, he's not alive anymore, but on the way over, I said to him, put a sock in it today. <laughs> we don't need, we just need to listen. We don't need to talk. And that's what we did. We had two and a half hours of bobber. <laughs> never stopped talking. <laughs> But here's what happened, and this is so telling. Uh, Bob Bird said, I was back in West Virginia a couple of weeks ago, and they introduced me as the Speaker of the House. Mm -hmm. And he had a big head of white hair, and so did the Speaker of the House. And he said, that really bothered me. And he said, and this is what I really liked. He said, I was in a hotel the other day. He didn't have cable at his house in Washington. And he said, I flipped on it, and he said, there was C-SPAN. And I sat there and I watched somebody give a speech. And he says, do you always let everybody speak like that? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, sir. When we put the speaker on, we let it run to the end. Uh, we go gavel to gavel on everything we do. And he said, well, I've changed my mind. <laughs> and he said, I told Russell Long the other day. He said, Russell, we're going to have to step aside. <laughs> and, you know, the young kids in here are... We need to, you know, this is a new world. We need to do, uh, we need to, to, to bring television. And he was in the minority. He was minority leader at the time. And Bob Dole was a minority, majority leader. And Bob Dole never opened his mouth about television. They, they, they learned but from, from Howard Baker. Don't, 
don't think, don't act like you're for this because the other side will be against it. And so <clears throat> Bob Bird led the charge, got the vote, was something, I think 22 members of the Senate voted against it, including my home state Senator Dan Quayle and David Warren, of all things. I mean, it was just, it was a bizarre group of people that voted against it. And, uh, but bingo, there was television in the Senate. Well, guess who set the record as speaking the most? <laughs> and he would get up and give the history of the Roman Empire, and, uh, was Bob Bird. It was a classic, nobody been like him. Uh, there probably will be anybody like him again. But that's how we got the Senate on television, as Bob Byrd decided that he was losing out, the Senate was losing out, the same way the House thought they were losing out, because the Senate got all the attention before that. So it's kind of the way it's been from the beginning of the country. <laughs> Bruce. That's a great Michael. story. Michael. Uh, yeah, wait, you wait. Michael. I'm a TV guy. <laughs> <laughs> we have to hear these dulcet tones. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Um, as someone who interviewed Michael Aaron, NJTV, <laughs> um, as someone who interviews people on television, I still struggle with <clears throat> whether to script out an interview ahead of time or wing it. Um, and I've been watching your interviews for many, many years, and I, uh, I admire your interviewing style greatly. Um, but I'm curious how you prepare for an interview, how much you script it, uh, and maybe it varies from guest to guest and week to week, depending on what else is going on. When I did the book notes show for 16 years, I read the book and made notes in the front. Never, once in a while I'd write a question down, and then uh, a few, a couple hours before I did the interview, I would sit down and go over my notes to remind me of what I wanted to ask about. Uh, and I'd underline through the books and all that stuff. Um, when I got to q and it, it, everything changed because it wasn't always a book. And we started using video. We never, very rarely ever used video with, with uh, book notes. And so this time around, we're looking for a video to go with the person that we're interviewing. And therefore, I've got in front of me a sheet of maybe 10 clips, which kind of helped the direction of the interview. But I've never written out the questions ever um, for an interview. And sometimes it doesn't work, you know. I mean, and sometimes, you, actually, you know, Larry King used to say when he interviewed people, he never read the book. <laughs> I always read the book. Now, just because he said he never read the book didn't make, mean that he didn't have a good interview. Because he walked into an interview, not having read the book, sat down and started like everybody else does. What's in this book? Uh, I start an interview, I know what's in the book. And the difference is, and that's, that, that's why I've always liked it, is people often write a book and about the, Kate knows this, and about the 14th chapter, you don't think anybody's paying attention, he starts to slip things in. <laughs> And the, the, I've always been intrigued by people who write a book. They write the book in solitude. They really don't talk to very many people about the book. They talk to their editor. Their editor looks at it. They ship it off to the printer. The printer prints it. It sits in the printing shop. And I've been to many printing presses to watch them come off. And they sit there. And, they, and nobody reads those in the printing shop at all. They just sit there. They put them in a truck. They go off to a bookstore. No one's read them yet. <clears throat> they take them home, an individual takes them home and reads them, and if, unless they have a book club, they never talk to anybody about what's in the book. I come along in the interview and I ask them the first time I've, anybody's ever asked them about what they wrote on page 320. <laughs> <laughs> and they look at you like, well, why are you asking me this? <laughs> I ask um, David Castle, no, uh, Crosby. Uh, Crosby still is a nice, and this is just one tiny example. I said, um, uh, Mr. Crosby, uh, did, were you, did you supply the necessary human goods for uh, Miss Ethery to have a child? I don't know how I added it. <laughs> and he said, I don't want to talk about that. And I said, well, it's in your book. <laughs> and that happens all the time. <laughs> a very good friend of mine in the old, old days, Jack Nelson, who used to run the LA Times Washington Bureau, was a good guy, he's a good friend, he's a good deceased man. He did a book, and in the book he talks about how 
he drank too much. And so in the interview, I mean, I knew him very well. I said, Jack, why did you put that in there that you drink too much? He, until the day he died, he never missed saying to me, why did you ask me about this? <laughs> <laughs> so like reading the book, in my case, I feel better about it and I can sit down and, and uh, it doesn't mean it's going to be a great interview, but it's, um, it's just my, my technique. Do you ever write all the questions out? Not in question form, but in subject, yeah, topic form. I'll do that. The, la while. the last two, <clears throat> the last two weeks, I've tr I've uh, thrown the security blanket away. I've left the legal pad on the table, and just winged it. And I think I'm going to keep trying that. <laughs> you have to really listen. Yeah. When you do that. That's really the answer is to listen. I'm not, I mean. It, and I, I used to, and I'm, even, I'm getting older, but I don't even do it anymore. I used to miss the answer to some questions, and I'd ask it again. <laughs> and I just, and I, you know, I, my favorite all-time one of these happenings was out in, believe this or not, back in 1984, it was in Mission Viejo, California. <clears throat> and I'm, we're doing this tour around the country during the campaign, because everybody knew that Reagan was going to win again, and <clears throat> there wasn't many issues in Mondale, uh Good guy, but he didn't make it. He wasn't going to win. <laughs> he wasn't going to win. <laughs> so we went around the country and did these different places all over. And in Mission Viejo, I'm sitting in this. Uh, it's a, it's, it was a uh, built from scratch village, and behind me is this big reservoir. And I'm sitting in a crazy way. Anybody care? I'm sitting there talking to the commissioner of water, water commissioner, <laughs> <laughs> trying to think of things to ask him. <laughs> and uh, I said to him, Mr. Commissioner, Mr. Chairman, uh, how many gallons of water are there back here? And he said, I have no idea. <laughs> now, five minutes later, I swear to God, I asked him this. <laughs> I, I got exactly what I deserved. He said, you asked me that question once before. I didn't know the answer. To that. <laughs> so listening is the real important thing. And when you're getting time cues, it's sometimes a little difficult. Well, we don't. I never allowed anybody to talk to me in my time. I, 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 I'm sure you... Uh, aren't as touchy as I was. I didn't want somebody constantly talking to me. I wanted, we used to, you know, they, they, my colleagues don't even agree with me now. They, they let people talk to them. I would never let anybody because it would distract. And they put it on a screen. I said, just type, tell me what you want. You know, tell me how much time I've got left. And, and uh, that was the great pleasure that I had. I, I could completely wing it. And I didn't have a producer telling me what I should ask. And if you give them an opportunity, they will do it. And God bless them. I don't blame them. I mean, I'd probably do the same thing. But uh, uh, I, I never had an IFB, except to hear the calls from the callers. I'm going to, Kathy, I'm going to go to you because I want you to ask your question. She has a question, and it's, I'm so glad we got onto book notes. And, you don't remember your question? I had it written down. No, my, I, I, I think if I, if I know what you're referring to. You have to introduce yourself. I'm Kathy Kleeman. I'm the senior communications officer here at Eagleton. And I think the question was, what book hasn't been written, a Washington book that you think should be, or what person hasn't been profiled in a book that you think should be? Um. <laughs> <laughs> As I, the longer I've been in what I've been there, sadly, for 49 years. <laughs> the longer I've been there, the more I come to the conclusion that every single thing is based on money. And it's been written, but I think it needs to go farther. I think that somebody needs to write that book that shows not only does the money affect the politicians in the town, but it affects the think tanks where they get their money and what influences who they bring to their, well, we cover tons of them, and uh, every single part of Washington now is based on money. It didn't seem that way when I got there, but it's probably because I didn't know any of it. But uh, as far as an individual, there are some absolutely fantastic people in Washington that get no attention at all. I often say there are only about a thousand people that appear on national television. And uh, it's the same thousand all the time, these recycling. And, uh, and it's because it works. 
I don't want to get too specific with this, but it's always interesting to me when the networks pull an individual out of the United States Senate and begin to have that person on their program week after week after week, and they hold no power or have no real role. They just like the way they talk. And uh, I always fascinated when the Wall Street Journal one time in an editorial, it's the only place I've ever seen this, called John McCain. That, that I wasn't talking about John McCain in this case, but he was the, uh, he was the fair-haired senator for a long time for all the networks. Uh, they call him the chairman of the media party. <laughs> and uh, why, I'm not sure. I like John McCain. I've been able to interview him a couple times. I actually stood in his cell in Hanoi. So, I mean, I have a, you know, uh, and I get asked, I don't get asked anymore, but I got for years, are you John McCain? So, <laughs> before John, that I got, and this makes more sense to you, as you'll see, uh, are you John Glenn? Yes, and yes. I got that so many times. Uh, but um, uh, they're just, I don't, I don't have anybody on the top of my head, but there are a lot of people. The trick is, though, today, getting somebody to read them. Uh, you know, that's, that's the trick today, is getting people to read. I mean, if you look on the bestseller list sometimes, you wonder what's going on here. Yeah. What, what does that mean? I, well, because what I'm thinking is that when we have authors here and we say you can buy the book and we'll have the author sign it outside, you got lines of people and they're buying books and I wonder how many of those take them home and read them. Well, years ago, and I don't even know if this is true, that a friend of mine who wrote books said that the survey that was done says that 50% of the books that are bought and are never read. 50%? I don't know. I mean, uh, I'll tell you this, the number of books that are bought are, and are not finished is huge. <laughs> because um, my wife always finishes the book. And she reads fiction all the time. I never read fiction. I only read nonfiction. Yeah. I, and I don't always finish a book because if I'm not learning something, I say, why would I learn? Yeah. I, I was actually toying with asking you that, and then didn't. So now I will. Um, you had you interviewed all those people on book notes, and they were all nonfiction. So that's obviously a deliberate decision. But you never read fiction, even whether or not you were going to interview. I had to. What, what, what is it? Can you, have you thought about it? What's the preference, sort of, what's that about? Well, I think it's easy to, to explain it. When I go to the movies, uh, three out of four movies will be documentaries. I just like information, real information. I, uh, uh, I've just never been interested. I know this is an insult to you, an English professor. <laughs> uh, Student, not professor. Uh, I just, I just, I don't know. I don't know why. My parents, my mother read uh, non-fiction. My dad didn't read it all much. Um, you know, there wasn't much around the house. And I didn't have that. What a tremendous importance it is that the parents, you know, get you involved early in reading. I was always running to the radio station because I wanted to be a disc jockey. <laughs> so, I, you know, my reading habits really kicked in when I was 45. That's when I started really reading. And I read a book a week for 16 years. Uh, and then I hit the wall and said, uh, I gotta stop doing this because it's, I mean, I was reading all the time. Is that why you stopped? Why yeah. did you stop book notes? It drives my wife nuts when I say out loud that the reason I stopped was because I wanted to get married and my wife wouldn't put up with me getting up at three o'clock in the morning and reading these books. <laughs> and she's always offended by that, so I won't say it. <laughs> <laughs> On video. <laughs> yeah. She, you know, she won't watch me anyway, so I got <laughs> Kate, you had a question? I was going to ask favorite interviews, but I hate when people ask me favorite stories. So maybe... Uh, you've got to introduce yourself. Oh, sorry. I'm Kate Zernicke. Um, I'm a reporter for the New York Times. Um, do you have... Were there... Can you give an example of an unexpectedly good interview and on the contrary, an unexpectedly bad interview? Mm -hmm. I, that, nothing comes to mind right now because a lot of them are so good, um, and not because of me, but the, the people come prepared to talk. Uh, I love interviewing historians, and I would say that it's rare that I ever interview Doug Brinkley or Richard Norton Smith or Robert Carroll or Doug uh, or Harold Holzer or these people that I've interviewed over the years, where I just come away amazed at how they know all that. 
Uh, and so I, I really just love interviewing historians. The most recent interview that I did, uh, the person that I interviewed that, uh, was uh, Terry Larson for his uh, Dead Weight, which is number one. And um, I've, I've interviewed him three times. And he's just a casual guy that just knows how to tell the story. Uh, but often, if I went back over the list and there had been about 1,350 interviews on something like It'd be, it'd be an odd list of, um, I remember when I interviewed Gorbachev, what I remember about the Gorbachev interview is not so much of what he said, it was the machinations running up to the interview where he tr kept trying to cut the interview back. Mm -hmm. And, but the most fascinating part about it for me was that his a regular translator, Pavel Palaschenko, <clears throat> uh, he interpreted for me and for him <laughs> so that we could have a consecutive interview instead of uh, I mean, I mean, a simultaneous interview instead of a consecutive interview because if it had only been a 30 minute interview this turned out to be an hour. Uh, but he tried to, uh, Gorbachev tried to uh, cut it to 30 minutes uh, before he got there and then they tried to cut it to 40 and I kept saying no it's an hour it's got to be an hour. Uh, so I often remember those kind of circumstances but where I learned <clears throat> um, is from the historian or somebody that's written a great story narrative. Most people do a pretty good job, but we walk away from most interviews saying that was worth the time. Once in a while, um, I, I can remember one, I'm not going to name him uh, because it's not fair, he's a great writer, but he, people often write hard and talk soft. <laughs> and that drives me crazy. You know, I've got this fabulous <clears throat> book that they just said all these strong things in it, and you sit down and talk to them, and everything is rounded up edges, and it's all. And I'm sure Kate, you would not be that way. So. <laughs> Are you writing another book? Not yet. That's why I was hoping to hear what you, who you thought we should write a book about. <laughs> <laughs> Keep thinking. The gentleman in the back has, has Oh, I apologize. Um, Hi, uh, John Lazarus, I'm a Rutgers alum, Eagleton alum, um, social studies teacher, and an avid uh, watcher of C-SPAN for 20 years. Um, my question is, New Jersey is an underserved market for public affairs. We get New York TV in the north and Philly TV in the south. Uh, we used to have this wonderful little network called NJN, which our current governor thought was uh, Soviet style or something, I think his quote was. Um, it exists in a different format now. Um, Next door in Pennsylvania, they have PCN, which is sort of C-SPAN model, C-SPAN inspired. I would wonder if you ever see a C-SPAN model working in New Jersey, like PCN. What do you think, Nancy? We, I'd like to answer. <laughs> Based on C-SPAN, we started one in New Jersey called Gavel to Gavel, and it lasted the cable television industry put together, and we had a network that lasted five, sorry, wait for the mic. I apologize. I know that. Um, it, we started a program in New Jersey called Gavel to Gavel many years ago. We had a network that linked all the cable companies in the state, and it lasted for about five years and failed. So New Jersey is on the same plane with Japan. <laughs> <laughs> Japan, <clears throat> we were in business with a guy for ten years trying, he wanted to start one. He started it and it lasted about three years and nobody cared. I'm leaving. He's calling on people. <laughs> I'm seeing them. That's I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm so, Ruth, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's recorded. Unfortunately, I did this for a living. I know you did. <laughs> it's hard. I know it's hard it's to fun. change Thank you. Yeah. So I'm Nancy Cronick, um, and I work here. I teach in the School of Communication Information and work in the library and have the good fortune of not only giving Brian Lamb an award that he doesn't have in his bio, <laughs> the James Madison Award for promoting the public's right to know, but I'm a graduate of C-SPAN in the Classroom, which is a great program. I don't know if you still have exactly the program, but it's a great way to really learn media literacy. But that's not my question, but you can, answer, you can talk about it. My question is, what about the Supreme Court? <laughs> Video in the Supreme Court. Keeps yeah. coming up. Oh, it, it, I've never been in a front group that they don't ask about that because we all want to see the Supreme Court in our living rooms and there's no excuse for not being able to see them except they don't want to <laughs> let us see and I didn't want them. Uh, but you know though it, it's interesting because 
they have this fact it's a fabulous institution it's incredibly well run you don't have to agree with every decision but it's a very well run part of our government it's small it's contained there are nine law offices inside that building and they they have this idea that television would ruin what they have now they don't even like to talk about this because they know when they talk about it it sounds a little crazy because they're paid by taxpayers they're in a taxpayer paid for building they have 75 hours a year total that they are in oral argument of any kind they have tenure for life and there is really no real reason why they couldn't go on television because the chief uh, the chief justice has the gavel he can stop anybody from talking anytime he wants to <clears throat> and I don't know what they're afraid of I've talked to them about individually about it I don't go over and lobby them there but it would you know we talk to them ask them on camera what they think about it and uh, they have this idea that television will destroy this wonderful institution and I don't frankly you wouldn't expect me to get it. I, I, it just doesn't make sense to me. A new, a younger generation someday will say we need to educate our public about what this institution looks like. We get the audio every week on Friday from the previous week. It used to be uh, six months after the term when we get the audio. Uh, they allow pencil press in there. They allow the sketch artists in there. They've gone and, and, and we put the audio on our television network and put the pictures with it. So it's about as close as you can get. But they're absolutely convinced and they are very stubborn on this that they don't want to talk about it. We just had a discussion last week with one and said, don't, don't even bring it up. They don't like it. They're harassed by it, frankly, if you want to know the truth, because so many people ask them, why don't you go and tell them? Just remember they have tenure. <laughs> and if they've been there 15 years, or they've been there until they're 70 years old, they get the same amount of money for the rest of their lives, so they have no threat whatsoever. There's been one justice out of 110 impeached, and that was Samuel uh, Chase years ago, and he didn't get convicted, so there's not much to worry about. Elizabeth. <clears throat> See, Liz, I, didn't, I, didn't I, I noticed. <laughs> oh, I Hi, my name is Elizabeth Maddow. I direct our youth political participation program here at Eagleton. And I really appreciate the work that you do uh, with young people, for young people. And one thing we know in the research is there's a really different, one stark contrast between young people and older generations is a very different sense of civic duty um, with young people. It really is divorced from politics, sort of an apolitical definition of civic duty. I'm wondering, based on the work you've done, do you think that's something that can be reversed? How do you reverse it? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I really don't. I mean, and I'm not being flip about it. Um, I kind of thought when we started that it would lead to more involvement on the part of people. Uh, it has led to the involvement of a lot of people, but uh, not the numbers. But, you know, I think it's just a matter of time, but I'm not sure. Uh, Thomas could probably tell us more than anybody in this room. Uh, you know, you've got friends, you're 21 years old, you've got a lot of friends. That, are they interested in politics at all? Interested in civic duty? Uh, do you, oh, okay. Um, do you want me to stand up? Yes. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. No. Uh, well, I'm a poli-sci major and a history minor, so for all the classes that I'm in, more or less, yes. But those other friends who are not, they really couldn't care less. Uh, or they, they feel that their vote doesn't count, which to me doesn't make any sense. I, I, I will tell you, um, I think more than anything else, I was, um, my father got me interested in politics. And so I think it, more than anything, it has to start from home. And like a lot of things, you know, your parents are your first teachers, as I've learned. So if you don't have at least one parent or guardian in the home that is, willing to light that fire in you to excite you about civic engagement in politics, then it's really hard to say down the road, you know, to be excited about it and, and enjoy it, so. Yeah, I don't think I've heard it better. <laughs> However, though, I think a lot of people get into it when they get older. I, I wasn't that. I was interested, but I wasn't as, certainly as interested as I am now. And as I got older, I got more and more interested. But I don't think we'll ever convince everybody to do this. I'll come back to you, Beth, but I'm going to go to the... <laughs> Hello, 
Hello, it's nice to finally see you, sir. Um, first of all, thank you. Your for name? My name is Sergeant Hassan, United States Army. Um, your three networks, your three channels of your network are the only three channel favorites I have on my TV. So those are the only three that I go back to constantly, back and forth. Um, two questions real quick. Number one, White House Correspondents' Dinner. How do you feel about that? Because it looks like there is a pundit class, those thousand people that you mentioned that we constantly see over and over and over again. And second, will we ever have a C-SPAN 4? <laughs> <laughs> While we'll be on it. No. <laughs> and, and there's only one, there's a uh, reason, simple reason for it. You don't need a C-SPAN 4 because all we need to do is figure out how to get you more and more events on the internet. Uh, there's not going to be any room. Things are going to change in the future. Um, but I hope we can continue to add more events, you know, through our, our website. The White House Correspondents' Dinner, <coughs> I've got to be very careful what I say here because, uh, I mean, I'm not careful. I, I don't have to be careful because of the people involved. I just don't want to sound like I'm, um, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> one of the reasons that we thought years ago that we ought to televise the White House Correspondents' Dinner and the Radio TV Correspondents' Dinner and the Washington Press Club Dinner was because it, it really is a bad it, it, this, I'll just say what I think. It's a bad thing for journalists to party with their sources. Uh, I've always believed I be civil to your sources, friendly with people in Washington, but I don't want to be their friend. I don't want to be in their homes. I don't want to be their pals. I don't want to have that just get in the way at all. I just it, it just seems to me that there's so much. Um, and we we do at our network. People go to this. They're going to go to this White House Correspondents' Dinner. Um, and I don't begrudge our folks for going there. I haven't been to one for years. I will not go again unless for some reason I absolutely have to. Uh, I don't like the evening. It's three thousand people in a room. You can't move. Um, you can't. You know. And your your people never shut up when the speakers get up in front of the room. Uh, and I could go on and on. I just, I just don't want to be a jerk about this. But uh, it's odd to me that the Gridiron Club, which some of you may know about in Washington, uh, every year they, they only exist for one dinner. That's the only reason that they exist. And they do have some scholarships that they give away. But they have 650 people that go to this dinner. Mm -hmm. And the president goes once in a while. President Obama hasn't gone that often. But uh, they won't let us tell them. And it just seems to defeat everything that a journalist says they are, that they're for openness. And they, here, here are these journalists, and they're all nice people. I know a lot of them. They're in this room in their white tie and tails and their gowns. And they're talking to cabinet officers and the president, and they have a cocktail party before and all this kind of stuff. <clears throat> but they're saying, no, you can't come in to see our little private party. We've asked them for 25 years to let us televise it. And we get, they really just absolutely have no interest whatsoever in, in letting us ever televise it. And it just seems to me to be a bad symbol. Uh, I, I think the town would get along just fine without all these dinners. Uh, but we televise them so people in the country can see who's there, what's being said. I think you don't have to go back too far to remember presidents getting up in, in the middle of a war, uh, in the middle of very bad times where people are having, they don't have food on their table, uh, making jokes in front of these people while they eat their steak dinners. And it just doesn't seem to me for journalists to be the wisest thing to do. But we will continue to cover them. And we'll cover the red carpet. That's gotten worse and worse over the years. <laughs> yeah. um, and, I, but I'm, believe me, I'm in, in our institution, C-SPAN, I'm the old fuddy-duddy, and I don't mind saying it, uh, but I've been an old fuddy-duddy for 35 years. <laughs> Thanks for the question. But it's, I'm in trouble now. <laughs> Beth. I'm Beth Heyer, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm involved with the League of Women Voters, and 
Um, one of the concerns, there was some conversation before about the lack of civic engagement among our young people. One of the concerns is that civics education per se has pretty much disappeared from the curriculum in, in, in our middle schools where it used to be or even in our high schools except as a special elective or something but it's not universal um, and there is some interest in trying to revive that. What are your thoughts on that and, and how do you think we might change that so that we can increase the level of civic engagement among our young people who actually come to understand how our government works? I don't have an answer for you that's very satisfying. Um, I would just say that what has drawn me to politics and history and civics and all that are good stories. Uh, I think if you stand up in front of a bunch of kids and tell good stories about how this all works and the people involved in it, you stand a much better chance of getting people involved in it. I love stories. I love to tell stories. I love to hear stories. And I think... Uh, but not fiction. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can tell me you can tell me fiction. That's what fiction is. You want to. <laughs> it's all fictional, everything you're hearing. Is uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not opposed to fiction. <laughs> I just don't read it. <laughs> but but I, I actually, though, I think, and any journalist in this room will tell you that that's what they're basically doing is telling stories. That's right. And I think it brings it all to life. That's why I love these historians. They tell stories. I, I'm absolutely amazed at how much they know. And even when they don't know, they tell us. That's fiction. That's fiction. Yeah. I mean, I'll give you an example from in, in my life. After interviewing, one, one day I interviewed Richard Martin Smith, who just finished a book on Rockefeller. Um, and he, and um, uh, this was years ago. This was 22 years ago. And in the middle of the interview, he said to me, I said, how did you get involved in in uh, history. He said, well, when I was nine years old, and one of the young ladies, or I can't remember who it was today, when we were talking to some students, talked about how their parents, yeah, it was Maxine, and he said her parents took, took her all the time to historic sites and presidential houses. Well, Richard told me in this interview, he said, well, I really got into history when I was starting at nine years old, and my parents would, would uh, go on vacation, but I insisted that we go to historic sites, and I went to, uh, when I started in nine years old, I went to all the grave sites of all the present. And so I remember saying to myself, on the spot, I'm going to do that. <laughs> and I did it. It took me 18 months, but I went to every grave site of every present, every dead present. And, however, <laughs> no, I went to, I mean, God bless George W. Bush, but George Herbert Walker Bush, his grave site's built. Right. And I had the distinct, excuse me, Mr. President, uh, honor of walking around his grave site where they were talking about on camera. So, uh, but we did a book called Who's Burying Grant's Tomb? Um, and I, I, took, I took pictures everywhere I went, and there were three occasions I asked a, a tourist to take my picture when we were there, and I said, would you mind taking my picture? I want to prove that I was here at this grave site. And there were three occasions there was nobody in the cemetery, so I had to take my own selfie. <laughs> this is years ago, by the way. I was taking selfies years ago. <laughs> but I put that in a little book, and I went, Richard, uh, at the time, uh, he, he was running the, uh, the Reagan Library, and I went out there, because I've been to all the libraries, and I went into his office, and I dumped this on his desk, and I said, I did it. <laughs> and uh, so I had to figure out some way, because I don't consider myself a historian, I wanted to top him, so I went to all the vice presidents. <laughs> <laughs> but I learned something. You know, I mean, it was just incredibly interesting to learn places in the country and who's buried there. Right. You know, right. the, the value right. of the Ohio presidents versus <clears throat> and the vice president, the New York Ohio connection in those early years, all that kind of stuff. So I don't have the answer, but just get these teachers to tell more stories, <laughs> less engage some more stories. Of the presidents that you interviewed, which which one told the best stories? Um, you interviewed about a half a dozen of them, right? Something like that. Yeah. Well, as we were talking earlier, I had the distinct uh, 
uh, an interesting experience of working around Lyndon Johnson for two years, and then I worked in the Nixon administration in the Office of Telecommunications Policy, but I never met him until I interviewed him long after he had been out of the presidency. And um, I don't even remember if he told stories. I just remember sitting there like, I can't, I can't believe this man sitting in front of me. You know, that face was everywhere all the time. I never interviewed Johnson, although I worked there when I was in the Navy for a couple of years. Uh, who told the best stories? George Herbert Walker Bush came on with after he was out of office. He did that. He never did a memoir. He did a book with uh, Brent Scowcroft on foreign policy. Uh, George W. Bush did a pretty good job. I mean, he was always a, a, he was very accessible. President Obama is not accessible to us for some reason. Uh, I interviewed him once in the Oval Office, and that's a story I won't tell tonight, but it's a strange one. Uh, well, I will tell you this. I interviewed him in the Oval Office, and I asked him why he hadn't redecorated his office, and he said because of the economy, and we didn't want to do that, and 10 days later, they had completely redecorated <laughs> We never figured out what that was all about. <laughs> so uh, we ran that interview anyway. Uh, but um, for, you know, the biggest problem with interviewing presidents, and it's always a kick. I don't care who it is. Uh, Bill Clinton was a guy, uh, and, and I've interviewed him several times, um, who did something that almost I don't think any other president did. He literally had the ability, and you've all seen this, so you know to just stop and think for about 10 seconds before he answered. And he wasn't in a hurry. And in today's world, everybody's in a hurry. I have to tell you, though, most of these interviews that President Obama gives are about seven or eight minutes long. That's all they get. And they often set it up so that they have one camera, one chair, he sits still, the correspondent comes in, asks a few questions and goes. Uh, the, he's, he's been more generous with uh, 60 minutes than anybody, but I noticed he hasn't been on there for a while. Uh, but presidents tell, have, are interviewed so often that it's really hard to get them to tell you anything new and different. That's why I wouldn't say they're, they're interesting interviews, they're, they're not the best interviews, because you hear most of them. And everybody in our business is looking for that little nugget that's a lead story on the front page of the New York Times. And, uh, it doesn't always work out so well. And you got everybody watching every interview that you ever do with the press. But uh, uh, I don't have any. I've got stories, but uh, probably I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Would you just so people can hear this, because um, the experience that you had when you were in the Johnson White House, your job that you mentioned before, but you well, I was, I was in the Navy, and uh, they had this. Uh, called it a collateral duty. It wasn't your main duty. I was in the Pentagon for two years. And you could interview for this, and they would make you, uh, if you passed the test, and I don't ever know what the test was, but you could be a social aide. Uh, and it was really kind of a glorified gopher position, but you were an extension of the first family. And Chuck Robb was there when I, he was an aide when I was an aide, and so it was a whole different ballgame because he married the president's daughter. And we, were, we were all involved in that, and, and uh, that was a lot of fun. But it, I was, um, w the learning experience was just phenomenal because I would often uh, introduce the guests that came to the White House in the receiving line to the president. And, they would just walk up to me, and of course, everybody that meets the president, unless they've done it for years, is nervous wreck. And they'd come up and I'd say, what's your name? And they would tell me their name, and then the, the game was that the president would greet them, and you'd just turn to the president and say, Tom Smith, and then he'd say, Tom, good to see you again. And of course, <laughs> Tom wanted to talk to the president for as long as he could. Then there was another one of us on the other side that said, uh, Mr. Smith, come right this way. <laughs> because, I mean, and people are dazed. They're absolutely dazed when they meet a president. It's amazing, because you know, there's nobody that you see on television anymore than a president. Or, and when they come there, they're just kind of wide-eyed. And some of them uh, razzle-dazzle more than others. Uh, it, it was, I remember, I had a date one night at a event at the White House, and um, she was a Republican, and she said that she didn't like Bill Clinton at all. And um, oh boy, I shouldn't tell this. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're halfway in. You're uh, stuck. 
<laughs> so I'm standing there, and it was a. I think it was. A, I think it was one of the Irish. I think the Irish. Uh, the Taoiseach, the French Prime Minister, was there or something, and President Clinton walked up, and my date went kind of like this, and <laughs> they, he kind of. They just kind of locked in, and I just pulled back from the two of them talking, and then she's a Democrat today. <laughs> <laughs> but I saw that so often with him. Uh, people would go in there not liking, they said they didn't like him, and then they'd come out with this reaction, and it's no wonder that he's as popular as he is. But uh, uh, he, the Johnson experience was fantastic. I mean, it was nothing like it. We had the wedding, and two days later, I got out of the Navy uh, with an honorable discharge. I didn't do anything wrong with it. <laughs> but it was very interesting. We had a 25-page document telling us what we had to do at the wedding, stuff like that, which is, you know. And uh, he was in the military, obviously he was a Marine, and the Vietnam War was underway. All of us were very sensitive. Uh, I was, I'll tell you one story, I was in the Pentagon in the public affairs office, uh, and I answered the phones and the questions from the networks who would call up and they would want to, they want Robert McNamara to be on Meet the Press, and he never went on until he quit. Um, and I'd say, you know, one of the guys calling, Bill Small used to call all the time from CBS, and I said, Bill, you know the answer, I don't have to. Uh, and they said, well, i got to ask. But one day I'm sitting at my desk right in the middle of this wedding, and I get a call from an AP report at the White House, and she said, I knew her, and she said, Brian, are you acting as Chuck Ross press secretary? <laughs> and I had agreed, Liz Carpenter was Mrs. Johnson's uh, press person, and I had agreed that if she had some questions about the military that I'd answer them, just have reporters call at the desk there. Well, I said, it was Fran Lewin from the AP, she said, but I said, Fran, uh, no, I'm just kind of answering a question. Well, long story, short, she writes a story, Chuck Robb has press it. <laughs> <laughs> and the president was home watching the news that night, and the local Channel 7 there read, you know, uh, but I don't remember, I think it was the captain. Captain Charles Robb is soon to marry the president's daughter, and it turns out he has a press secretary assigned to him in the Pentagon. Well, the president saw that and went out of his... Line. He said, call Bob McNamara, the Secretary of Defense, and said, I don't know what's going on over there, but I wanted to stop. It. So I just kind of wander in. <laughs> and I'm a lieutenant junior grade, which is an insignificant rank. And I'm, I'm at my desk, and there's a lieutenant colonel standing at the door and said, You're to sit in that chair for the rest of the day, and you're not to ask, answer any questions from the media about Chuck Robb. And um, I, I didn't particularly bother me, and I remember saying to myself, uh, I wonder how long I have to wait to continue to answer questions. So I waited a couple of days, <clears throat> and again, we've got to remember, I'm getting out in about two months, so I'm not a whole lot worried about it. So the calls came in, uh, and I'd answer the questions, and uh, Chuck was going to be the adjutant for the Marine Parade down at 8th and I in Washington on a Friday night, and uh, I called up these guys that I work, was working with in the networks, and I said, you can't tell anybody I, I called you. <laughs> Chuck Rock's going to be at the, at the parade, and you, he's going to be the adjutant. He'll be out front with a sword and all that stuff. And I said, you might want to get your camera over there so you can get some B-roll, we call it, for the, for the uh, wedding. So I thought, well, I better go to the parade just to see what's, you know, that they're there and what, what happened. So I'm standing behind the bleachers at the parade at 8th and I at the Marine thing, and uh, it's about ready to start, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes this long black limousine. And in that long black limousine was the President of the United States. And uh, he gets out of the car, and uh, he sees me. Um, and he is really ticked, because he sees the cameras. And he wants to know how the cameras got there, and what was I doing there, and so the next morning at 7 o'clock I get a call from the naval aide to the president says, you better get over to the White House and you better have a good explanation. Because the president's quite unhappy that all those cameras were there for Chuck Rodwell's night. So I went over to the White House and they said, if you don't have a good explanation, you're going right into the Oval. And this guy was a great guy. And I talked to him and told him what was going on and he wrote a 
I had to sit and wait until the memo went into the president on that Saturday morning, and he came back and said, everything's fine, you're well. So those kind of experiences were worth their weight in gold. <laughs> <laughs> what was your explanation? Huh? What was your explanation? I, I don't know. I tried very hard not to tell uh, the <laughs> But, uh, you know, I just mumbled my way through it. <laughs> but uh, it was uh, it was fun while I while it was lasted. <laughs> uh, anyway. Wow, there's a lot more I'm sure in the room. And you want to take another question, or sure. do you want me to cut it? The time is up. But <laughs> if you're uh, you can't do this on TV, but here I can. We, actually, we could though. We used to never pay attention. <laughs> the most powerful moment I ever had in my life was at one of those conferences Debbie and I described and I had introduced, it was up on a big um, dais uh, and had introduced the vice president um, who was uh, at that time George Herbert Walker Bush and it was during the height of the ERA uh, controversy and President Reagan wasn't going to support it. And so there were a number of women legislators agitated about this and so forth, and the vice president was getting to the point that he was ready to stop what he was, he was ready to finish. And so I was sitting next to him and he said, passed a note and said, just no more questions or one more question or something. And I thought he hadn't been up there long enough. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the most powerful moment of my life. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't listen. That's the ERA question. <laughs> no, I didn't have that kind of communication. Actually, what happened then? The mics got turned off in the, uh, on the floor. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, lots of things, course. but we'll take yours. Yeah. Hi, Jacqueline Malzon. I'm an undergraduate associate with Eagleton. Um, I was just curious because I know that most of what C-SPAN airs is American politics. I was wondering if you could provide some insight as to the decision to start airing PMQs. That was back in 1989, before you were born. <laughs> um, the way that happened was that we, uh, we were always looking in the early days to do something that was different. and. Uh, we went over uh, to London to do some interviews with some of the British uh, members of the Parliament. And while we were over there, we discovered that the House of Lords, of all things, was on television. And so we got some of the debates, and they're deadly dull, and they're awful. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, but we put it on just to say, this is, this is a comparative look at government. And um, we hired a guy over there uh, to be our producer. And, and a uh, terrific guy, and uh, he was our producer for 25 years. Uh, mm. Bernard Tate's his name, and Bernard's still around, and uh, he's not dead work for us anymore, but he's retired. But they invited me to go over there in the House of Commons and testify about television. Mm. And I was like a kid in a candy shop. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I mean, it was, I mean, I had never had that much fun. Uh, because there was not, I didn't, couldn't lose anything. You know, I mean, it wasn't like I'm talking to our own congresses. They had nothing to say about it. So I went over there, and they call it giving evidence. And I gave evidence. And I, I remember what I said to them. I said, you know, we've been doing this for 10 years, and the sky has not fallen yet. Give it a try. And they didn't do it because of me, but they did it. And then we started covering the prime minister's question time, and we've just stuck with it all these years. Um, and I, a story about that was... Uh, Douglas Hurd was the foreign minister of uh, Great Britain years ago when Jim Baker was the, the I, I heard this third hand, was the Secretary of State. And uh, Douglas Hurd came to visit him in, in the State Department and uh, one morning, and it was like a Monday morning, and uh, he said, they, these were recorded on Wednesdays and we brought them on Sunday nights. And Jim Baker said to Douglas Hurd, he said, boy, I love watching those Prime Minister's questions. I watched it last night, it was just great. Heard said, "Why? Why would anybody want to watch that?" <laughs> and so it's it's not it's not unusual for people in their own country to think nobody cares about this kind of stuff. And he couldn't believe that anybody would want to watch the question. <laughs> yeah, we just we've stuck with it and tried to do others. We've done the Australians, we've done the French, we've done the Irish, um, we've done South Africa. Uh, it's really hard though. The language is a real problem. <laughs> Translation thing, and uh, the meanest, roughest. 
most interesting group of people in the parliament are the Australians. They're nasty. <laughs> really? They're not nasty people, but they're nasty in their body. They're worse than anything you see from us. And the softest, and I'm an Irishman by ancestor, the Irish are not tough at all. The British are the most entertaining. All right, this is the last question because you had your hand up before, so I'll go to you. <laughs> Uh, hello, Brian. Uh, thank you for coming and thank you for taking my question. Uh, my name is Minha Hassan. I'm a state-based journalist uh, here in New Jersey. Um, we hear so much about hyper-partisanship in Congress and um, having seen these guys up close for three decades, is that imagined or, I mean, is it just being, is it more well known now that these guys are partisan or have they always been partisan and you just didn't know it or? If they are more partisan, what do you think has contributed to it? We just say it's like the proliferation of uh, advocacy journalism, as they call it, or is it something else? It is a question that everybody's talking about <clears throat> because you see them. <clears throat> Those of you in the room that remember the civil rights time, there was nothing nastier than the debate between the Southern Democrats and the Northern Democrats uh, over civil rights. I mean, Richard Russell was a white separatist. There's a building named after him on Capitol Hill. He was admired by his colleagues. Uh, he was a close friend of Lyndon Johnson's. That was, they were just as nasty back then um, in a different kind of a way. It's just, it is more public now. But as we've talked about this all day today, <clears throat> my take on it is, um, and I'm just like you, you look up and say, why? But uh, why are they this way? But there's a great divide in the country. A great divide. I mean, it's right close to, 47, 47 with the rest of them, you know, swinging with it. And it's just divided. And, and they now can all have their say. And you may not like that, but I do. I never liked it when there were only a few voices that told me that's the way it is, August 5th, 1995. <clears throat> uh, and that isn't all the way it is. There's lots of things going on in the world. And now you even know it more when you see some of the stuff that's on the evening newscast or the morning shows, uh, it's, it's, uh, it has nothing to do with news. It's all entertainment. So it's shifted a lot. I don't have an answer whether it's really more bitter than it was. There's a heck of a lot more money involved in it today. And there's, that it seems to be that's one of the big stakes. But uh, I, can't, I can't give you any more than you already know when you see it for yourself. I'd like to conclude this uh, by mentioning, I'm not going to read a long list of honors that Brian Lem has received, and I think you can all read those in the program and online. But there's one that I want to mention. He, by the way, he does have a number of honorary doctorates, and I do apologize for not calling you Dr. Lem tonight. But, uh, <laughs> Um, but uh, I, I consider it an honor uh, for the Eagleton Institute to have a visit from him. Um, and uh, added to that is I think he's probably the only visitor we've had here who has been awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And that was in 2007. It's the highest award that's given in the United States to a civilian. And it is, and I'm reading this not to get it wrong, for his dedication to a transparent political system and the free flow of ideas. And I think you've seen, uh, you've seen a demonstration for many years as you watch C-SPAN, but I think it's been reinforced this evening and I want to thank you again so much for coming to Eagle. Thank you. Let me thank all of you who have gone out of your way to come here tonight. Uh, it's an honor for me to uh, get your questions and hear about this. And I'm terribly impressed by the Eagleton Institute. Uh, we've tried to do some of this at Purdue. I'm going to take back everything I've learned today uh, and see if we can't um, use, do some of the things you've done. But thank you all so much. Right. It's been really fun. Thank you.